Hey everyone, uh, first speaker for the afternoon session, Sanjeev Arora. He'll tell us about semantic coding and hashing. Uh, okay, so I'll, uh, so this, this joint work uh, in a few papers with uh, Yuanjili, Ying Yuliang, Feng Yuma, and Andrei Ustesky. So, some of the papers are with subsets of them, and I'll mention that later. Um, okay, so uh, semantics. Um, let me start by the, with this example. So which pair of sentences out of these uh, five are most similar? Which Tiger rules this jungle, milk flows, flows from the bottle, you can't complain about food in Berkeley, a lion hunts in a forest, this is a fun workshop, isn't it? One in four. One in four, correct, yeah. So, uh, okay. Now, notice that they have no words in common. Right? No words in common but you knew that they were similar. Okay, so I'll uh, set up this area using some, uh, I call history, but it's really recent history, uh, but background really. So semantic hashing. This paper had a very big uh, uh, conceptual impact on me when I saw it like five years ago or something. Uh, by Hinton Salakutniko. Hinton is of course the leader of the recent wave of deep learning work. Um, and uh, this paper made two points, in my opinion. Uh, and some of the points I only understood in retro retrospect, what they were saying. So the, the first main point was, and this relates to the discussion this morning in some of the talks, approaches like nearest neighbor, which are very popular in theory, assume that meaning of whatever object you're looking at resides in a metric property. OK? Points in similarity equals small L sub p distance. And this is false in most settings, including text. Okay, as we saw in the previous example. And the second point, what is this? Uh, and then the second point they made was that in most of these settings, meaning corresponds to latent structure, and uh, which they propose can be recovered in many settings using Hinton's restricted Boltzmann machine, which is something like a simple one layer neural net. Uh, and they showed experimentally that it beats, for many settings, uh, nearest neighbor with locality sensitive hash. Okay, so these kinds of things. Uh, so what is the RBM? For this talk, you won't need it too much. Uh, it won't need the details too much, but I want to show you roughly what it's like. So it has it's a it's a uh, it's a simple base net or a graphical model. So there's visible units where you'll input the data, and there's hidden units. And uh, the distribution of hidden and visible units is a joint distribution expressed using this, uh, this kind of energy function, which is like an easing model. Uh, but it's bipartite, OK? So the, all the interactions are entirely between here and here. Uh, sorry, between this and this, not, not, no interactions within. So it's uh, some kind of an easing model. And so it defines a joint distribution. And then given some value for your data, x, there is a most likely value for the hash h. And that's the semantic hash. Okay, so that was the main message of this paper, and they show that that actually is a much better way to recover uh, latent structure. Okay, so for instance, if you input those two sentences, that what I said, you know, you would find that the 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 latent, uh, the, sorry, the hidden uh, hash uh, will be actually similar for those two related sentences. So latent structure means means that hash. What is latent structure? Good. Yeah. So. As I said, this is only background, yeah. So I'm getting there. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That's the point of the talk. Anything else? So, and what is the basic ability? Is it just the, or the, whatever, the indicator vectors? So what, do you, what, what is the basic representation? of Oh, the here, for, for text? Yeah, it's just which words are in it and their frequency. Yeah, the bag of words. Okay? And we agreed that those two sentences had no words in common, so those vectors will not at all be written. Yes? So I should think of the hash as the same as, uh, as the hash in locality sensitive. No. But it's of the hidden stuff. No. It's a completely different functional form. It's this easing model. I mean, you never saw this in locality sensitive hashing. Okay. It's some easing model. So there are two points here. One is there's some hidden units. Yeah. And two is that the function that you're applying is different. No. So the hidden units you can think of as, you know, this is the data, this is the hash. And there's some ah, okay. computation that maps data to hash, right? In that sense, there's no, no magic. Uh, the magic, if any, is this funny form, 
and, uh, and that this funny form recovers some latent structure. Okay, so, so you train this, it's, so unlike in LSH and so on where the hash doesn't depend on the data set, this hash is trained. Actually, maybe that's the third main point, which I should. This hash is trained using data. So you use a lot of Xs, you use it to train this easing model, you know, find this best fit, and then that's your hash for the, for the remaining points. So that's actually a third main point I should mention. Okay, so yeah, what is this latent structure? So exactly, I'm just telling you, you know, what I saw five years ago, and it's like uh, completely a new world, right? What the heck is going on? Okay, point out, uh, so, uh, so I, I've understood now for a couple of years what's going on, but uh, um, with my student Rostesky, we uh, said, okay, maybe we can make the same point using a simpler model, not an RBM. And turns out you can illustrate this form, this exact phenomenon that you know the, there's no latent, there's no visible structure, but there's a latent structure using a simple mixture model, not just an RBM. Uh, but I won't give that example here. But you know, it, it's almost an exercise. You can you can do that using a simple mixture model. Okay, so. Uh, Next piece of history, word embeddings. So these have been popular in information retrieval and NLP, natural language processing, since uh, at least 1990. It's called, it, where it was called latent semantic analysis. And what it does is it represents the, each word with a vector. And such that human judgments about which words are similar, like lion and tiger are similar, correspond to similarity between the vectors, okay, vector in a product. So these are called word embeddings. And so, uh, they were used to capture similarity of words. So like uh, it's used in information retrieval, like if there's a search query or web search query. Uh, you know, when the, the query, you know, uh, like if there's a query about line, you might want to extend to tiger. So, so those two words are very similar, so you may have, uh, you may use these word embeddings to figure out which words are similar. And uh, recently, so this is the, uh, this, this was a uh, paper that caused a lot of attention, that uh, got a lot of attention uh, by Michelob et al, a, a Google team, uh, which showed that using word embeddings or a special type of word embedding, you can solve word analogy tasks using linear algebra. So, so word analogy, I mean, you know, man is to woman as king is to, and whoops, I also have the answer here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so, uh, so how do you solve it by linear algebra? So you take the word embeddings which I haven't shown you how to compute yet, but I will. So you take the word embeddings, which are vectors, and now you um, take the difference between the vector for the man and woman, so that difference, and now you take the vector for king, and you look for the word, so again, this should have appeared now with a, so you look for the word, such that that difference is as close to this difference as possible. And among all dictionary words, like there are 100,000 words in the English dictionary, queen happens to be the one, the best one, okay? So they showed that using their embeddings, you could solve analogies by this simple linear algebra. Okay, so yeah, and that's objective function. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's another piece of history. So now I'll get to your question. What is meaning anyway, right? What is meaning? What is this latent structure? And how can mathematics capture it? Okay, and the goal uh, will be that we're trying to do theory. We'll have relatively clean models and probably correct algorithms. That's what we want to build towards. And uh, for most of the talk, I'll restrict attention to text, although recent work suggests that similar ideas apply to collaborative filtering, like you know, recommending movies or music to somebody based on what they like, and uh, vision, recognizing objects, and so on. Okay, so what is meaning? Okay, uh, just in the text setting. So here's a test. Think of a word that co-occurs with cow, drink, babies, and calcium. Milk. Milk. Okay. What you just saw was an example of what's called, so the linguists thought about this a lot, you know, what is meaning and so on. And uh, just by introspection, they realized, okay, like why are lion and tiger similar, right? They're similar because, you know, they occur with, in similar contexts with other words. So this, this is called the distributional hypothesis of meaning. It's a, uh, it comes from linguistics that a meaning of a word is determined by the words it co-occurs with. Okay, so it's a kind of a social network notion of who you are, right? You are who your friends are, right? So who you hang out with. So a meaning of a word is determined by words it co-occurs with. 
Okay? So it's a distributional notion of meaning. Okay? And somehow, if you have a similar distribution of words around you, then you, you are similar. Okay? So two words that have a similar distribution of the words around them. Okay, so this is a, a somewhat imperfect capturing of meaning, okay, and it's known that this is not the ultimate definition of meaning. You, there are things that violate this, but it's still a pretty good definition. Okay, so this definition already suggests that the following is a way to capture the meaning of a word, namely, just give me the co-occurrence probabilities of all other words around this word. Okay, so look at a large corpus like Wikipedia, and around this word, you look at how often does some other word C occur, uh, say, within distance phi of it in the corpus. So that's some empirical distribution of other words around it. And that distribution captures the meaning of the word. Okay? So that's the high-dimensional word embedding. What's the dimension of this? There are 100,000 words in the dictionary, and the dimension of this vector is 100,000. So when you say five, you mean five words away. Five words away, yeah. In, so every time this word occurs, what other words are occurring? And you, Keep track of those co-occurrence probabilities, empirical co-occurrence probabilities. Okay, so uh, so that's a uh, that's a simple word embedding. Turns out, so Church and Hanks again, these are uh, linguists. They suggested a better measure than co-occurrence, which is called PMI, point-wise mutual information. Okay, this occurred in Tengyuma's talk yesterday, uh, in the uh, in the quick talk session. So what is it? It's log of some quantity. And what is that quantity? The joint probability divided by the product of the marginal probabilities, the probability of the word and the probability of the other word C. So this, is some kind, this ratio is some kind of a correlation measure, right? So if W and C occur sort of uncorrelated, then the joint probability would be the product of the marginals. And the, that ratio is 1, and the log is 0. Okay. So for uncorrelated words, the log is uh, this, this measure is zero. And for correlated words where you know, conditional on W of C occurs much more than you would expect from just the product probability, then that number is more than one and the log is something substantial. Okay? So this measure captures, it's a measure of correlation, but it's on the log scale. Okay? And, and you can sort of see where this is going. Okay? Remember I started with the Hinton model which had an exponential and this has a log. Okay? This is the, the, I think those are related. Okay? So now, even better. So this is still a 100,000 dimensional vector, okay? So for word W, you have all these 100,000 dimensional PMI measures for all the other words. An even better version of this is a dimension reduced version of the above, of the above two. You can do it with, via singular value decomposition or neural nets, etc. Okay? So those are low dimensional word embeddings. Something like 300 dimensions seems to be good. Okay? 100, 200, 300. Yeah. So the PMI is a symmetric notion. Is that it's symmetric. Variable? You, uh, you can also consider asymmetric versions. So this is a very big area, which I'm not going into. Yeah, so these are just like very simple ideas. But these are already very powerful. Okay. So yeah, this is the main point that uh, there's a log here, okay? And that log, I think, is related to the exponential. I think there's really something going on with meaning that involves a log. Okay, history C. Neural language models, this is also from the last uh, 15 years or so. It started with a paper of ben Benji and Ducharme and Koloba and Weston. So this is, again, an uh, uh, example of, you know, you're trying to understand the meaning of language, right? So you're trying to do things with it, uh, natural language processing. And the hypothesis is, it's related to the distribution hypothesis, that a neural net has understood language if it can predict, given the last few words, or last 10 words, whatever, the next word. What does that mean? It just has a good, so it, it, uh, the neural net, given the last 10 words, generates some distribution on words. And then the empirical word that actually occurs there happens to have high probability. Okay, So that's the training. So yeah, you, how do you train a ne recurrent neural net? So it gets positive feedback if the actual next word had high probability and negative feedback otherwise. So neural net, as it goes along, the text has a sort of probability distribution on what word it expects to see next. And if its guess is correct, then it gets positive feedback and otherwise negative. Okay, that's roughly the idea. That's the way you train it. And Mikulov et al. had a simple functional form. 
uh, to predict the word from the five surrounding words, uh, which is the following. It's a, it's a following expression that you have a vector for each word. And the probability of the word w, given w1 through w5, is proportional to the exponential of the inner product of bw with the average vector of the last five words. OK, it's a kind of funny functional form. Firstly, there's an exponential. Secondly, it's saying something like the probability of the next word is related to the average vector of the last five words, something like that. What is bw? BW is the, okay, so the, so, the, uh, so the neural net uh, has some parameters. And these are the parameters of the neural net, BW, a vector. So the neural net is storing a vector for every word in the dictionary. And it's training those, right? those are its parameters. And it's trying to train the VW so that this distribution actually describes very well what's happening. Okay, so these are the, Parameters of neural net. Sorry? What's the dimension of BW? 300. That's good, yeah. What was the reason to pick 5? Like, yeah. you, you can make it 7, 10, you know, it's. And things get better. There's, there's a little, yeah, it captures slightly different things. Uh, 5 was just something I picked up. That's and all. the distance between the two words doesn't matter. You just treat the 5 words nearest you as a set. There are variants of this which actually use that to, yeah. This is only one of many, many things you can try. Yeah. Was there another question? Yeah. Just, uh, I think that in, the, in this paper, uh, I think this by itself was not enough, and there were some people that claimed that other tricks that were used, like these yeah. uh, biasing sampling, were actually. We'll get to the biasing. We'll get to the biasing. That's actually very important, and yeah, people actually didn't understand it. I have a nice explanation. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So. Uh, then you know people said, okay, you can understand, you can have word embeddings. You can also create sentence and paragraph embeddings. Capture the meaning of a paragraph. And what do you do with the, uh, once you capture the meaning of a paragraph? You try to understand, you know, if it's a paragraph which is a Yelp review, is it a positive Yelp review or negative Yelp? You know, things like that. So, so you can do, uh, you can use similar ideas to create sentence and paragraph embeddings. And uh, one paper was Kiros et al. Skip thought. And it's these things are useful for other NLP tasks like spotting paraphrases. You know, are these similar paragraphs or not, you know, uh, or sentiment analysis. Is this a positive Yelp review or a negative Yelp review? Or, or given the review, predict, what, is it a five-star review or a four-star review or three-star review? So again, the yeah. VWs, you're choosing them to make this a good function, or what are the VWs? Okay, so let me say it again. So the neural net has some parameters. Every neural net has parameters. The parameters of this neural net happen to be a vector for every word. 300 dimensional vector for every word. So it's like uh, you, 30 million parameters which or something. You're to find? Which you're going to train. Mm -hmm. And the corpus has like size of a few billion. And you're going to uh, train this model so that given, you know, it, it, this distribution fits the, very well, the, roughly that's what you do. Any other questions? All right, so the rest of the talk is uh, we're going to develop theoretical models that explain what latent structure has been captured by such semantic coding and hashing. And you'll see a su surprising confluence of new and old methods, which were considered distinct, like RNNs, RBMs, PMI-based embeddings, skip thoughts, et cetera. Some of these came from other fields, like PMI embeddings came from uh, NLP and information retrieval. Okay, and the idea in this is what's the latent structure? So. Uh, so there's some process going on in the head of the writer, right? Imagine there's a simple single person writing Wikipedia. So there's some semantic process going on. And, um, and then that semantic process leads to some words appearing, right? And so there must be some connection between this underlying semantic process and the words that are being emitted. And so we'll come up with a model for that, okay? A very simple model, which will remind you of the RBM. And then we'll see that that model implies some properties of this empirical distribution, and they'll turn, turn out to fit reasonably well uh, the empirical distributions. Okay, so, uh, so uh, let me clarify or sharpen that question by this uh, question. Why do low dimensional word vectors exist? Okay, so like this neural net, right, why does it have 300 dimensional vectors that empirically describe that distribution, right? So. Uh, Right, so I already said this, there was a Church and Hanks embedding and uh, you're fitting to PMI, right? But you ha the vector is all, you know, rows and columns are words, so that's a 100,000 by 100,000 matrix. 
And uh, WW prime entry is this PMI measure. It's nonlinear measure of co-occurrence uh, correlation. And, uh, and you're fitting it, it's fitting, uh, you know, you're approximating this 100,000 by 100,000 uh, matrix by some 300 dimensional matrix. Okay, that's the SVD, singular value decomposition. And that turns out to be a good fit. And the question is, what property of language causes this 100,000 by 100,000 matrix to have approximate rank 300, right? So describe some plausible semantic process which leads to this property, right? So that could be something theory can do. And then, of course, we'll see if having a theoretical model gives you some new insight, which the, these people didn't have. OK, so the main issue here, uh, as I pointed out earlier, is the nonlinearity and the logarithm, OK? Uh, so for instance, if you didn't have the log, then there's an existing explanation, which is topic models, which I won't describe here, but those of you who've seen it, turns out this is a reasonable explanation for uh, co-occurrence counts being low dimensional, but this is the log of the co-occurrence count. OK, so uh, in this paper, we, uh, this, uh, which appeared in TACL this summer, this is a, a journal in, uh, in computational linguistics. Actually, it has a very interesting publication model, if anybody wants to talk to me about it. So, um, it's, uh, so what we have here is uh, what we think of as a dynamic version of a log linear topic model. Also, uh, this was proposed by me and Hinton, same person who did the RBM around the same time. Uh, and let me describe to you. Um, so there's a semantic space inside the writer's head. And each direction in, uh, uh, and let's say it's d-dimensional. And each direction in d-dimensions is associated with a discourse, which is some narrow topic, OK? So uh, you might be talking about hunting, and then you may be talking about lions and tigers or something. OK, now, as this hypothetical writer or set of writers generate Wikipedia, uh, we are assuming that, oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing I forgot to say, that each word, all, W, also is associated with a vector, VW, in this latent space. Okay? And as this uh, writer or, or set of writers generate Wikipedia, we, say that the we imagine that the corpus was generated by doing a random walk on the sphere of this discourse vector C. Okay? And the process of outputting words is that the probability that the word is output when the discourse is CT is proportional to the exponential of VW and CT. So what is the property of this distribution? So CT is a direction in space, and it's moving around. And as it moves around, it generates a distribution on words. In any step, the words that are output are those that are likely to be, that, that are actually have high inner product with this direction okay, that's moving around. So of course, words that are close to each other right, would tend to have high inner product with the same CTs. So they tend to co-occur. Right? Intuitively, this has that property. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So. In um, traditional topic models, you would not have had this exponential. We would not have the exponential, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So Ravi's comment was that if you take away the exponential, this would be more like a normal topic model. OK, so now, um, any questions about this model? What's the random walk you do on the this? Uh, uniform random walk, yeah. We're assuming that. OK. Geometric random walk. So, uh, right, so it, it, within a document, you know, the, what's being talked about drifts a little bit, right? And then in the next document, it might make a big jump. So, big jumps are allowed, and that doesn't change the distribution much. Any other questions? Okay, so the question is oops, what is this? Yeah, what distribution on biograms, oh, sorry, biograms is, you know, pairs of words occurring close to each other. Um, what distribution on pairs of words does this process generate, right? And does it have that property that that, uh, you know, that that PMI matrix that we saw in the previous slide has low rank? And an aside is that this is very reminiscent of RBM. Of course, uh, it, this model comes from Hinton again. Hinton just had a static model, and we have a random walk here. But it's very reminiscent. And yeah, this was a phase in Hinton's life where he was very interested in these log linear models. Okay, so that's where RBM and this both come from. Um, so this is just an illustration. Uh, there's nothing much here for a theory audience that, except it's depicting a random walk. And the random walk is just depicting, this is a real English paragraph that's going through. And uh, Ying Yu, who's uh, here, uh, just fitted a random walk to it, okay, using the word vectors that we trained. So if you want to know how this was fitted, ask me later. But yeah, that's the 
It's just showing you a random walk that's happening as you go through this paragraph. Okay, so we're inferring this backwards induction, backwards inference. Uh, we've already learned the word vectors and so on, and we are inferring the random walk that must have led to this paragraph. Any questions? What does it mean to infer a random walk? Yeah, it's, it is a statistical procedure to do it, but I, I won't go into the details. As I said, if you can ask me later. This was to, as an illustration, okay, that, that this is a random walk and it's generating words, emitting words. And how did I get that random walk? And it was because then you fitted a random walk to actual text, so, so which you can do. So the random walk is, is, the, uh, is what you call the, uh, the, the, the CT, the, the discourse vector. We call it a discourse vector, yeah. It's a sort of what's being talked about right now. It's uh, MAP or it's MLE or MAP of that particular paragraph that you're given. Oh, you mean that figure, yeah. It's something like that, yeah. Uh, okay, so how do we analyze this? Okay, so you have to integrate out the random walk, right? So you are just observing words. You don't know what the random walk was. And the distribution that you're seeing is, you know, the integration over the random walk, right? Because the huge long random walk took place and the words appeared and you saw the empirical distribution and now you're trying to see what that distribution should be like. So a key assumption in our proof is a spatial isotropy of word vectors. This was a new discovery, which we thought had to be true if things like this work. And uh, then we measured it, and it is actually fairly isotropic. So that is in the bulk, the word vectors behave like a set of random vectors, OK? So like scaled Gaussian. And so a consequence is that uh, if you have any sort of word vectors strewn around in space like this, uh, then when you do a random walk, then for most directions, this partition function, zc, which is the sum over w of exponential vw times c, is approximately constant. Okay. So th this can be proven under that assumption, and it's actually empirically true. So we find word vectors, and then we tested this, and it's actually pretty true. Okay. So we, did, we came up with this uh, just purely from theory, because that's the only way the theory could possibly work, like right? the integration could work. Uh, and then we went back and saw that actually in NLP in the last, a few years ago, people had noticed this, that you can just ignore this partition function. It stays constant. It's called self-normalization for these probabilistic models. And people had studied it. Okay, So we sort of stumbled upon a fact that people had empirically found, that ignore the partition function, treat it as a constant, and it works. Okay. So the, the statement yeah. depends on the dimension, right? If you had right. yeah. previous dimensions. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. So it really, it can only work in low dimensions. Low this dimensions. fact can only work in low dimensions, correct. There's actually another place in the theory where low dimension is used. I, I'll see if I get to it. So, uh, so then if you make that assumption, the integration works out well. And what you can show yeah, that under this assumptions, right, which I already said, the score space, CT is doing a random walk, and the word vectors are spatially isotropic. I can show, uh, we can show that the main theorem is so that this PMI count for any pair of words is equal to the inner product. It's, it's very related, uh, related to the inner product of the corresponding word vectors. Okay, so the word vectors are latent variables in this model. It's a probabilistic model. And the inner product of those word vectors is up to scaling, the PMI. Okay, so it explains why this PMI matrix is low rank. Okay, these low dimensional vectors actually the inner products correspond to the PMI value. And the log of the probability is VW square. And so the norm of the word vector determines the frequency and the spatial orientation, like the inner products, determine the meaning, right? Because the PMI values of all the other words determine the meaning of word W. So that's it. Okay, and this actually fits within 17%. Uh, entry-wise, uh, on average, so it answers question one. Actually, we came up with a different objective which fits somewhat better than this, but I won't go into that. Any questions? So, I mean, I don't know, if you replace the exponential by some other function, it, the log would be replaced sort of by its inverse, or? Uh, no, the log interacts very uh, very uh, intimately with the with the sphere, right? The sphere is like a Gaussian, so I'm not sure if any function would work. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So deriving embedding methods. How am I doing on time? Oh. 
Okay, so previous nonlinear, it turns out previous nonlinear embedding methods like word to vec which I mentioned, and GloVe, uh, which is a Stanford version, are approximations to max likelihood fit to our model. Okay, so I won't, I just quickly go over it. You know, if you look at the expressions, they are kind of including the GloVe expression, which, uh, sorry, the word to vec expression that I mentioned earlier. These turn out to be like uh, max likelihood fit. Okay. One uh, theory question here that arises, if you actually look at this fitting objective, that it's not SVD, it's weighted SVD. Weighted SVD is this uh, objective that you are, you are given a matrix A, and you're trying to find a rank K matrix X that minimizes you know, the, the, the L2's uh, difference, but there's a weighting WIJ. So this weighting matrix WIJ uh, makes this weighted SVD and makes it NP hard. So, uh, so that's our training objective. It can be solved in practice, like many machine learning problems, by just gradient descent, plus a regularizer called Aragrad. And uh, some of my students have been working on deriving provable polynomial time algorithms for it, uh, for this. And they, they made some progress when W is random like. Okay, if these numbers are themselves random like, then you can actually solve this, probably. Okay, next question. Why do relations correspond to directions? Remember, queen is equal to king minus man plus woman, right? This kind of facts. Why do, why do word vectors solve analogies? And actually, there was some controversy about it, you know, because anecdotal counterexamples can be found to that. Uh, so we sort of explored it a little bit more, both empirically and theoretically. And what we do with our theory is to give theoretical support for the following, that for every relation R, so in this case, relation would be like male, female, masculine, feminine. Uh, the difference vectors of these align according to some direction which depends on the relation. So this can be proven, okay? Uh, so I'm running a little low on time. Um, yeah, so, uh, so you know, this involves formalizing what is a relation that actually existed in a previous paper by Pennington et al. Um, and uh, the idea is that, you know, this masculine-feminine relation, what does it mean it's a relation? It means that for other words, chi, the probability that they occur in the neighborhood of king and in the neighborhood of queen, that ratio is equal to, you know, for all other masculine feminine pairs, this, the ratio of the probabilities, okay? So, it, so that's a sort of reasonable definition of a relation because if chi is unrelated to gender, right, then both sides are one, right? Uh, like uh, walking or talking, those are not related to gender, but if it's like dress or john, which are very gender specific, then these probabilities deviate from one in the same direction. Okay, so, so you can formalize this as saying that A and B satisfies this relation if this log of this is something like some constant, depending on the relation, plus noise, okay? I just want to say, this is to do empirically, right? Because you wouldn't find too many sentences. Right? This you cannot verify empirically, no. It's not enough samples. But what our model implies is that for such a relation R, there exist directions such that this, is, uh, this happens, okay? What I claim. That the difference vector for the words in this relation, A minus B, corresponds to some direction, plus smaller noise. And this noise is smaller than what was over here. So this you can verify. This we verified. Okay, so we verified it using lots of, uh, I mentioned before, that lots of relations on, uh, that are available online, free base and so on. And this is true. Okay, and actually this noise does behave just like Gaussian. Okay. Another paper, polysemy and word vectors. So, so far I, I was just saying this theory, theory explains empirically the things that people are doing. Uh, but now, uh, here's something that was not known and there was a new discovery from our theory. So polysemy, you know, so word vectors, how do they contain the various meanings of the word? Okay, because words have multiple meanings. So it's called polysemy. So the word tie can mean the article of clothing or a physical act. Okay. So how does the word vector for tie contain those two meanings? So we thought about it and we said, okay, let's think about the following thought experiment that tie is really two words, tie one and tie two, which happen to be represented by the same letters TIE. So then you can try the following thought experiment, but you can do it in practice. So suppose this means that there were two words, tie one and tie two, and they were unrelated words and they were put together in the same uh, word. So you can try this synthetically, okay? So take two random unrelated words, W and W2, where one is much more frequent than the other, and declare these to be a single new word, and compute its embedding in the model. So you have the embeddings of the old words, and you have the embedding of the new word, 
And how does the new embedding compare to the old embedding? And the answer is it's something like a linear combination. Okay. The embedding method is crazy, nonlinear logs and so on, but it behaves linearly like this. And this we can also explain mathematically in a model. And it turns out that our explanation then leads to a way to extract the different meanings. Uh, so I'm actually rushing through this. I'm out of time. But there's something called sparse coding, which is a, another NP hard thing which you can do in practice. Uh, and we can get you know, meanings out. So for instance, these are the meanings for Thai. So this is like the clothing meaning. This is like Thai, the like, uh, game. This is like a scoreless game, a tight game, scoreless, goalless, equalizer. This is like tying up things, wires, cables, etc. And this is opera, which I think might be junk, but some people tell me Thai is an important word in opera, so maybe it's not junk. Okay, so the point is this was a new discovery. Okay, people had always wondered how do how does polysemy affect word embeddings? And this was the clean answer. Um, and then I want to finish with sentence embeddings. This is a very new manuscript, which is a at some upcoming NIPS workshop. So uh, it's sentence embeddings, okay? So remember, these are computed using recurrent neural nets and so on. So we give a very simple sentence embeddings, which I'll describe, okay? And it's inspired by this work of Weeding et al., um, which was where the sentence embedding was just the average of the word embeddings in the sentence, okay? Which they show works sort of okay, although they showed other ways to improve it. But that was already there. And that seemed very reminiscent of our theory, so we explore it some more. And then we realized that actually the correct, so this took some playing around, but the correct model we think is the following. That uh, earlier I told you this model where, uh, where I didn't have this term, but we now think that this is actually the correct model. The probability W is output is a combination of two things. So this is the old probability, okay, the discourse and so on. And the first mode is just a background probability. So every word is a background probability and it just gets emitted, okay? So for instance, even though you're maybe talking about jungle, and which means you talk about lions and tigers and so on, but maybe somebody was eating a cake in the jungle, right? So that's like a background probability of cake, and that can also be emitted, okay? So this is our simple model, and then you analyze this, and so now the, uh, so some sentence was generated using this model, uh, and you know the word vectors, okay? You've estimated those, uh, again, by the model. So now what's the max likelihood estimate of the sentence vector? It's a, so the CT turns out is a weighted sum of the word vectors, okay, in this sentence. And this weighting is some, oh, this B sub beta sub W is a weighting. So it's a weighted sum of the word vectors in the sentence. And this weighting is something like A over A plus PW. PW is the background probability. So all of those you can estimate. Uh, and that actually uh, does really well, this embedding, okay? So this is a completely unsupervised method for sentence embeddings, right? Just train this method on Wikipedia. It really beats like some pretty highly tuned neural nets that people have come up with, uh, including skip thought and some standard thoughts and some standard tasks. Uh, yeah, and uh, also this weighting, uh, the experts when they see it, they are reminded of TFIDF. So this is a heuristic from information retrieval that you, in any uh, context when you're looking at words, you weight the words according to some heuristic called TFIDF. It's very reminiscent of that. But in this context, there was really no explanation why you should ever want to weigh the words, but it's a simple explanation out of this model. Okay, so I'll uh, conclude by uh, summarizing. Okay, so you can do a theory that explains and addresses behavior of seemingly intractable models, okay, that we've been scared of, such as RNNs and RBMs. Uh, the empirical results are good out of just, it's a theoretical model, but uh, you can solve it and you get sentence embeddings, uh, word embeddings. Uh, our sentence embedding is the best purely su unsupervised embedding we know of, okay? Better than the neural net, uh, yet it's completely transparent, okay? You understand exactly where it's coming from. Uh, and there's some unpublished work, maybe I'll talk about it in the quick talks later if there's time. Uh, you can use these sentence embeddings to understand fMRI, right? So fMRI data from the brain. They do blood flow measurements. Uh, you want to understand those. If, I, yeah, if there's time in the afternoon, I can give a brief talk about it. Um, yeah, and finally, the message that uh, I've been urging on all my friends is that we have to embrace this new age of algorithms. Uh, you know, it's not about you know, graphs and cliques or flows or whatever. You know, it's all this kind of 
uh, data, and uh, this is largely being driven by experimental discoveries, as you could see in this talk. Uh, but I think there's interesting theory to be done and new models to be created and so on. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? How did your sentence embedding do on those initial sentences? What did it say about those initial sentences that you, those, those examples that you gave? Yeah. Just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I actually came with the sentence only last night, but uh, okay. I'm pretty sure that it'll, be, it'll do the right thing. I mean, we've been testing it, yeah. I mean, I can see at a glance that it'll do pretty well, yeah. In, yeah. Your, in your random walk model, is it important that it's, so, so it's just this, is it important that it's a random walk? Because it's something you could imagine that, you know, a speaker who's trying to make a point, you know, is somehow trying to get the reader from one state to another state, and they're doing some sort of walk that's directed in some way or whatever. Uh, or is it yeah. Important so, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, the question is, is it really a random walk, like <laughs> uniform in the sphere? Uh, I think because Wikipedia has, you know, hundreds and thousands of writers, it does look kind of random. If you were to fit it to Shakespeare or something, probably it would not look so random. Uh, so notice that this is random, it looks random in the aggregate, right? I take the entire Wikipedia. Of course, any particular article in there is written in a certain voice and what we are, with a certain vocabulary. And so locally, it's not random, definitely. And, and yeah, people have, yeah, we've been, we've been looking at that kind of analysis too using some of our more sophisticated models with some colleagues who are very interested. So you mentioned yeah. Shakespeare. So how does this compare these predictions, say, according to your models, to uh, predictions that you do when you know who the speaker, who the writer is, and you have a model for that particular writer? Oh, it'll always be better to have, yeah, to fit a model to the writer, yeah. But you, uh, so uh, this is an aggregate model, mm -hmm. right? The random walk, right? So uh, you could, to do it, with, we're doing it with some uh, social scientist who is interested in analyzing text. So he's talking to us. Uh, we have to do something else. I mean, you can't treat it just as a random walk. Uh, so uh, yeah, so you have to do some tweaks to to understand specific text, blogs or something. So the, yes. there, there's work where you do this with compression, right? That, that, that you can sort of use compression algorithms to predict who the writer is. I don't know if you know this work. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's actually an easy trick. Yeah. It works. Yeah. No, I'm saying that's a different thing. Yeah. yeah. That's Could you completely different. The question? Yeah. There, the question was, you know, there's this work which uh, some kind of a signature of the writer, right? Which, which is an easier trick, I think. Like you can just see what their vocabulary is or something, what words they use. Their vocabulary, sort of prediction they use. To, uh, or predict, write according to the writer. Yes, you can do that. And the same thing. The, the, the so I think those are using topic models, yeah. That's a much more developed view. So Shakespeare's word vectors will not be uniform random on the sphere, presumably. No. Wait, one final question. Anyone else? Thanks, Thanks.